What's up, Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another live read leak thing. Um, again, I never know how to introduce these videos because it takes so many words to describe them. Basically, we're going through the leaks of uh, the third story in the sixth Tales from the Peterplex book, Nexi, which is called The Mimic, and that intrigues me. We know that Edwin is coming back in this story. Uh, Edwin from The Storyteller. You should probably read The Storyteller before reading this, uh, I assume. Um, but I'm hoping we get an origin story of The Mimic, at least. Um, I've heard a few things go around about what could be in this story, but uh, I think we should just get straight into it. Uh, this is live read by William Blaine Alton in the Freddit Discord, so go and uh, go and read it for yourself, or go and join so that you can catch up with other live reads as well. I've already done the second story, Drowning, so go and watch that. Ah, I'm so excited. I'm genuinely just really, really excited for this one because it could be big for the lore. It could be very, very big. So, let's get straight into it. Edwin Murray, his brow in its usual deep furrow, swore when his son's small but insistent hand tugged at Edwin's flannel shirt sleeve. The motion forced Edwin to give up on the intricate wiring job he was attempting. He's already better than Afton. Um, yeah, yeah, so, um, if you don't remember, basically, Edwin is connected to the Mimic in some way, or the Mimic program, or the Mimic model, or whatever. We probably think he built them. Um, and that's why we're getting a story about Edwin and the Mimic now. And I'm pretty sure this is gonna be in the past, because there was an incident that had to do with his son, I think. I think that was confirmed. Um, but there was a child who died at Freddy's, or whatever probably because of him, and that's why he doesn't like the Mimic anymore in the Storyteller. Um, Edwin looked down, expecting to see the badly cut thatch of David's fine brown hair. Instead, Edwin found himself looking... Why? Why are you doing this, man? <laughs> why? Nah, David has a lace over himself. He's a cute little ghost, and now David's sick. He's sneezing and coughing because of the lace. Um... That's what you get for playing with dusty old lace, Edwin said, his annoyance ebbing a bit. He had to admit that he enjoyed David's creativity and watching the lace thrash was amusing. Uh, it was early March and spring rain was sweeping in through a few of the cracks in the factory's old brick walls and dropping down from a couple of leaks in the tin roof. The water from those leaks collected on the third floor, but the moisture per pervaded the entire building. The windows are either boarded up or painted over, this is not ideal living situations. When Edwin had brought the abandoned factory to house his new business, he'd found yards and yards of knotted, crumbling lace throughout the building. Um, Edwin is confused the old owners left it there, but he figured he'd keep it around in case he wanted to get creative. His wife Fiona had liked it too. Five years before, when Edwin had acquired the building, he and Fiona had also just purchased the old Queen Anne mansion they'd planned to restore to its original grandeur. Queen Anne mansion. I swear that is from Lally's game, if I recall correctly. It No, it probably isn't. There was, de this This was definitely mentioned once, this isn't the first time I've heard this. I don't know how it would be connected, but there you go. Maybe Scott likes to reuse it, just like the, um, the, yeah, just like the same car was, was used many times in Phasma Frights. Um, she wanted to de redecorate using the lace, but after Fiona had died giving birth to David, Edwin had been tempted to get rid of all the lace. That makes sense, that makes sense why we haven't seen Fiona at all. Um, he decided to keep it, though, because it was more painful thinking of throwing it out than to keep it, and now David is a ghost. Okay. His impish, freckled face revealed, David grinned, sneezed once more, and wiped his nose so hard it was a miracle that the up-tilted snoot remained on the boy's face at all. We had an agreement, remember? You play quietly for an hour, Daddy gets work done, and then we go for ice cream. This sets David off. Chocolate chip ice cream! David, who was clutching a plush white tiger in his left hand, grabbed the lace again with his right. What, it, what does the tiger have to do with this? That's my question. David is dancing around begging for chocolate chip and Edwin is looking at him, analysing how the only similarities between him and his son is their eyes having a similar slope. Edwin was happy that David looked more like Fiona than Edwin. Fiona had been far lovelier than he was, as he often told her. 
Whenever he asked her, she'd tweak the full sandy brown moustache that Edwin had worn since his senior year in high school. I fell for your moustache, Fiona would tease. Now David is pounding the floor with a stick. Edwin was so excited when he learned he would be a father. He had a gorgeous, loving wife and a ton of money. For nearly all Edwin's 24 years of life, he'd loved building things. When he'd been about David's age, he'd begun taking apart his mother's small appliances so he could see how they worked, though they rarely still worked when he put them back together. His mother was amazingly tolerant of the need to frequently replace things. By the time Edwin was eight, he knew that he wanted to build useful machines that would change people's lives. He believed in automating life's most mundane tasks, and he was sure he could create robots to replace most household chores people didn't enjoy. This is scary. This implies Mr. Hugs isn't alone. Oh my god, we see Mr. Hugs. He got his first... His got... He got his first patent on a robotic vacuum cleaner when he was still a college student. Despite the bugs and high price point, it had sold well enough for Edwin to start his business right out of school. The vacuum also funded a good life for Edwin and Fiona, who had met at school and married as soon as they graduated. The vacuum was widely popular at first. Unfortunately, the machines don't have the longevity that customers ex expected, sorry, and complaints began rolling in. Eventually, sales fell, fell off. Uh, there's a rack of circus-like array of animal and other character costumes. I wonder what will the Mimic do with them. True, uh, we've already seen that in the epilogues. The Mimic is going into the costumes. Um, interesting stuff here. So Edwin is the creator of the Mr. Hugs. That must mean, by extension, he is cr the creator of the rest of the trash and the gang. And it also must mean that in... He, he probably owns the catalogues in, in that we see in FNAF 6. That's probably where we're buying the animatronics from. It's probably Edwin's. Maybe the mediocre melodies were Edwin's, right? Like, I don't know how far we can take this, really, because it's only Mr. Hugs. But, um, but you know, that it gives us some stuff to think about. If he created Mr. Hugs, then what other animatronics that we've seen did he create? That's the big question. And like, I feel like Edwin is like a massive part of the FNAF lore at this point. Um, because he created the Mimic. And the Mimic became Glitch Trap and it became Burn Trap. However way you want to say it, you know. So this is big. Like, this is a really big turning point in the series. And Edwin is sort of a catalyst to the return of Afton potentially. I do want to do a whole video on uh, what the Mimic is and like all the lore we need to know and stuff and possible theories. I would like to, do, maybe I'll do two videos, one like really informative and then the other theoretical. Let me know in the comments if you'd like that. Um, David Sean Murray, now attempting to do a somersault while still wrapped in lace, had come into the world just before dawn on a stormy fall morning and he'd arrived in full screaming fury. Given that Fiona had been bleeding to death as David catawalled, uh, Edwin assumed that David's protest against being taken from his mother's womb had been amplified by this probable understanding on some unfathomable mother-son bonded level that he was about to lose his mother for good. Or maybe Edwin was being fanciful. Maybe David was just a noisy boy. I hate how much this connects it in the flesh. I'm just putting it out there. A child being born... <laughs> A child being born, uh, a creation of Edwin's that be that goes on to become a Springtrap kind of version. Um, and there's other things as well that I've heard could connect to it, but we'll get there. We'll get there in due time, in due diligence. Uh, there's a rack of... Oh, wait, I've already read that. <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, David's screaming protest continued on for weeks, and instead of being able to work of his uh, inventions... Edwin had to tend to David. Edwin was a man hanging onto a what? A cliff's edge by the tip of his fingernails. For goodness sake, this has connections to the cliff. The, the cliffs, sorry. Where the frickin' mother dies in that story and Robert is left alone um, with with the child. Or is Robert the child? No, Robert is the, the guy. And then Robert is about to jump off the cliffs until he sees or he hears his son. Down at the bottom. It <laughs> why are there so many fast with frights parallels? Um David is four years old now. David is getting louder and louder and spinning faster and faster. So David goes spinning into Edwin's work table and knocked over the animatronic head he was working on. 
the head that of a bright yellow chick. Oh no! <laughs> Imagine Chica is a mediocre melody. Oh no. Oh no, Matt Pat's gonna see this and he's gonna be like, yep, here's confirmation that Chica is a mediocre melody because Edwin built all these things. Interesting, that's very interesting. So Edwin must be very early on, maybe even like a business par partner with Henry and William. That has potential. Edwin is the oldest board member um, that we see in the storyteller or that we we know that he is the oldest. Um, and that's for a reason. Uh, he rolled across the table and fell onto the cement floor. Uh, spark shot out of the chick's eye. David lost his balance entirely and landed on his rump. The boy's dark brown eyes blinked twice, then David's severely arched brows bunched. He buried his face in the tiger and started to cry. So I want to know if Faz if Fazbear Entertainment exists yet. And if it doesn't, then it means he was part of the existence. He was part of the creation of Fazbear Entertainment. And he was forgotten about because of an incident, maybe. That's interesting. David weighs 50 pounds and is three and a half feet tall. Edwin is 5'5", five five, he is struggling to carry him. Perhaps he could build a robot to do the job for him. Edwin's steps faltered. That's not a bad idea, he said to himself. Hmm. I, I see, I, hmm. Just a theory here and something that I'm seeing already in this story. I, I'm sorry to keep pausing, by the way. Um, is that like Edwin likes to automate things. Edwin likes to build robots to do the work for him, which is great. But is it a, like a possible parallel and kind of implication that he doesn't take responsibility? It like I, I don't know. I, I feel like that's that's him kind of like passing the the reins onto other people so that they can mess up. Like, uh, you know, I, I yeah, I don't think he's as bad as William, obviously, but uh, unless he killed loads of kids, uh, and then it's debatable, but probably not because, um, yeah. After Fiona passed away, Edwin had known he couldn't manage a house and his business property at the same time, and since the factory was where Edwin did his work, the choice of which to keep was an easy one. Thankfully, Edwin was an engineer slash architect, so he converted part of the factory's offices to a small apartment with a compact sitting area, a tiny gallery kitchen, one bedroom and one bathroom with a clawfoot tub. All the little rooms except the kitchen, which was floored with blue linoleum, now had water wall brown carpet. Uh, as David grew older, Edwin would have to create a second bedroom, but for now, keeping an eye on David was easier when they slept in the same room. Not that they slept there very often. Much of the time, Edwin worked on the factory's main level at night, and David slept on a cot nearby. A 5,000 square foot building. Yeah, that's that's not too much. Like, it, it, it's... Yeah. <laughs> Edwin is aware of this place being dangerous uh, for a little kid, but David's good and listens to his father. Edwin was peripherally aware that David was climbing onto his small mattress, which was nestled inside a wooden white tiger's head. Uh-oh. <laughs> so his son now possesses Tiger Rock, I'm assuming. The head, which Edwin had carved to mimic the look of David's favourite toy, arched up and over the top of the mattress. This is great storytelling, I will say. Uh, but um, David loves his bed as much as his toy, which is named Tiger. It's just Tiger. Daddy, Edwin, who had been contemplating the notion of mimicking, blinked and frowned at his son, who is now standing on the mattress holding up said plush tiger. Tiger wants to know if he can have an ice cream too. Edwin might ask Lucy, the owner of the ice cream parlor, to get him invisible ice cream. Grr, David said. That's what Tiger says about naps. Very wise, Edwin said. Um... David has given names to the sounds the factory makes. One of the old exposed pipes of the factory's first level clunks. This is the pipe fairy. More than one visitor to Edwin's business had expressed concern about David's safety in the old large building that sat at the edge of the four-way, the four-lane highway that ran through the industrial part of town. Uh, thinking of city skylines right here. Um, okay. Fitz. What type of name is Fitz? Well, like Fitzgerald? Uh. Uh, he's the delivery man that brings Edwin all his current projects and supplies his orders. He's expressed his worries about David getting hurt, mainly in regards to the levers machine that Edwin is pretty sure hadn't been used for over 30 years. Oh, he knows better than to go near that, Edwin said. He felt a need to reassure uh, Fitz, so he continued. All of the extra rooms are closed up, and I usually help him with the stairs. Uh, I built him a slide for coming down. You built your kid an indoor slide? Fitz raised his bushy black eyebrows as he took back the clipboard. Yep, Edwin said. He's back to repair the cheeker head now. 
Uh, it was the 18th character they've asked him to make. They've asked him to make. The, I mean, like, the factory, right? But, like, uh, is he not in charge? Is this Fazbear Entertainment? That's interesting. Um, he spent the last year and a half abandoning his own work to do another company shit. Oh, right, okay. Uh, he Edwin thought back to the day he'd signed away his own enterprise. You're doing the right thing, Grant Starling, the portly Fazbear Entertainment executive who negotiated the buyout, said as he watched Edwin scrawl his signature on the bottom of the 12-page contract. Now, when is this? When is this? We need to know when Edwin became a part of Fazbear Entertainment. Uh, clearly, he wasn't a founder. Uh, that's that's one thing that we know now. Uh, it was the early 70s. <gasps> it was the early 70s. Oh, the story is in... Oh, okay. Wait. Okay, yeah, Fazbear didn't exist until the 80s. 1983, to be specific. Um, he had to sell out to Fazbear. Yeah, yeah, this, this story takes place in the 80s, 100%, because of that. Um... But he's reflecting on the 70s. Okay, so it's the early 70s. People wanted more time to play and their minds were opening as well. Edwin had assumed these things would translate into a huge market for his machines. When his finances ran dry, he'd had no choice but to sell his company to Fazbear Enterprises. You have a real talent, Grant had said. We're happy to welcome you to the Fazbear family. So he did build Chica. That's why Chica has a different eye thing in FNAF 3. In the FNAF 3 ending, she has a circle instead of the lines. Um, that's why Chica's party world exists. Oh. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, interesting. Is that why he made a fun time Chica as well? Because he has the rights to that. He owns the rights to... Maybe not. I don't know. Interesting. Um... Back to Chica, her beak is dented, and one of the metal feathers atop its skull has snapped off. Edwin needs to work on the head, but something else is jumping around in his mind, a plan. A plan that would solve his current issue with David needing so much attention that Edwin simply can't give him with all the work. He's going to make a robot so that he's entertaining him. It put him three weeks behind in his projects for Fazbear Entertainment, but Edwin, working uh, feverishly and essentially giving up sleep entirely for many bleary-eyed days, was able able to take his idea from spark to completion in an amazing short amount of time. I'm building you a friend, Edwin had clarified. Tiger is my friend. Bro got dirt all over Tiger. They're going to have mac and cheese for dinner after they clean up Tiger. As Edwin had helped uh, David climb up the sharp flight of stairs, Edwin's chest tightened at the thought of his son having just a plush Tiger, and soon a robotic torso for a friend. Uh-oh. <laughs> Next year, David would be put in kindergarten, he couldn't pay for preschool. He, had, he tried to involve David in a community program, but they tried looking deeper into their situation, so Edwin stopped. By pulling wiring from rooms that he never used, taking pistons from a defunct industrial washing machine, and borrowing steel and spoons and gears and springs from the levers machine, Edwin had fashioned the torso, arms, and head of a primitive-looking endoskeleton. Once Edwin had constructed the legless robot, he had to build the computer for it. This he did by stealing hardware from some of his abandoned projects. Mr. Hugs really is the mastermind. <laughs> True. Um, now comes the challenging part. Edwin wanted to create a thinking mind that would learn by mimicking what it, has, it had observed. We were right. It had been Edwin's observation of how the bed he'd built for David mimicked David's favourite toy that had given him the idea. Thinking about the concept of mimicking so soon after casually contemplating having a robot to entertain his child had brought the whole idea together. So here's the question. If Mimic 1, the programme that is used in the Mimic, is Glitchtrap, then my question is... Is Glitchtrap just mimicking what he sees in Springtrap and what he saw in Spring Bonnie back in 1980s? Uh, and is, is he mimicking that or is he actually William Afton, right? And it's it's actually hard to tell right now. I think, I think story-wise it probably does make sense for it also to be Afton because Afton always comes back. That's just his, the, the key thing. But I, I see a lot of people like, kind of happier now that Afton might be gone. Like, I don't think he's gone, but 
It, it could be the case. We we don't. It could go either way. But what do you guys think in the comments? Uh, I guess we're gonna read more of this and maybe even see if if we we can figure it out. Um, I want you to know how painful it was to see y'all say Edwin built the mimic specifically for Fazbro or something along those lines. It's for David. That that makes uh, David's death even more heartbreaking. Um, I'm I'm sure we're gonna see it in a minute, but. Uh, he wrote his code very fast. He used the combination of Pascal and C to write his code. I'm assuming those are the two code writers or... Uh, do they exist in IRL? Let me know in real life. Uh, <laughs> he wrote it very quickly and took several shortcuts, but the job is done. Uh-oh, we know what happens when you take shortcuts together forever. Um, and now after a long 22 days, it's time to turn it on. David and Tiger had run in on him about to do so. David wrinkled his nose. Daddy, you stink, he announced. Thank you for pointing that out, Edwin said. He sets the endoskeleton down on the floor in front of David. We're getting a description of the head. The original head was just two large white doll eyes within a boxy piece of metal from a broken down compressor. But because it looked nothing like an actual head, he scrapped it. Um, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Because the square head, the square top looked nothing like the real head though, Edwin had tried again. He'd found a rounded bit of metal in the guts of the lever's machine. I don't know what this is, but I'm sure we'll know in the actual book. Uh, and he'd used it to form a narrow protuberance that jutted up from between the big white eyes. Under the eye housing, Edwin had welded in piece a hinged jaw that he formed out of parts of the lever's machine guide bars. Using a sir of novelty chattering teeth he'd found in a box full of bits and bobs on the third floor, Edwin had given his creation a big white toothed mouth. I'm getting Stitch Wraith vibes right here. I am. Getting all this hardware connected to its programming required wielding a large processor to the back of the skull and running a tangle of wires all around the skull. Wires stretched toward the back of the skull, dove in and out of both eye sockets, snaked through the mouth, and extended down the articulated neck that in turn connected with the metallic spine, which connected with a makeshift rib cage that was not as curved as Edwin had wanted it to be, but it worked. And the rib cage was linked to two robotic arms that ended in pincer-like hands. Uh, okay. David asked about a name earlier. I haven't given it a name, Edwin said. He thought about the program he'd written. He'd call in the program Mimic 1. Well, that would work. How about Mimic? He suggested. That's a wonderful idea, I said. Um, yeah, remember, I'm there. Okay, what, what are you doing? Uh, David made a face. That's a weird name, Daddy. This is the part where I throw David into traffic. Oh, damn, it's Legolas Mimic. Um, taking a deep breath, Edwin reached behind Mimic's neck and activated it. Startled, David whipped his head back and hugged Tiger, but he giggled. Um... Oh, Mimic, still moving slowly, pulled his head back and pantomimed hugging a tiger-sized invisible object. David giggled again. David put out a finger and touched Mimic's chest. Mimic put out a pincer and touched David's chest. Um, okay. I... Hmm. I think I know what's gonna happen. There's gonna be some sort of aggression, like like there's gonna be a fight or something. Uh, maybe oh no. If this is going where I think it's going, this is gonna be so sad. Is Edwin abusive? Because my uh, let me gather my thoughts real quick. If Edwin is abusive, the mimic will pick up on that. Like the mimic doesn't have any outside source really. So the Mimic is going to pick up on the fact that Edwin is being abusive and think, oh my gosh, that's what humans do. I need to mimic that. It's in my programming. It's in my nature to mimic human interaction. So I'm going to be abusive. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um... Yeah, I have a feeling that's where it's going to go. And I am so upset. <laughs> I am so upset that I have figured that out, if that is where this is going. It's probably not where it's going. But like, I, I feel like that is definitely where it's going. Edwin is going to be abusive. The Mimic is going to copy that. The Mimic is going to be abusive. And it's never going to stop. It's never going to stop. That's why Burn Trap kills. That's why Mimic in the epilogues kills. So, like, that's, that's very set in stone for me, I feel like. I feel like it's... It was told to mimic things, 
and it mimicked the wrong things. It mimicked the negatives. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Uh, David is now teaching at Patty Cake. Edwin has to take a shower, so he takes them upstairs with Mimic still well mimicking David. Uh, David takes Edwin's hand and Mimic grabs his waist. At first, Edwin is scared it may hurt him, but Mimic is gentle. It's interesting that he, he is already scared that it might hurt him. He's unsure about his own invention. He's unsure about the program, I, I think. The next two weeks were the best Edwin could remember having since Fiona had died. Edwin actually gets proper sleep now and wakes up the day ready to make the characters for Fazbear Entertainment. When Edwin had programmed Mimic, he hadn't had the parts he needed to give Mimic the ability to speak. I'm pretty sure a ton of bets just got lost with this alone. David had no issue with Mimic's mutinous. He started developing a sort of sign language to communicate with his robotic friend. David's sign language involved often hilarious imitations of the things he was trying to communicate. Ice cream, for example, was conveyed with a gesture that involved turning one hand into a bowl-like shape and using the other hand to approximate the shape of a spoon. This doesn't feel right. Um, <laughs> David would dip the spoon hand into the bowl hand and put the spoon hand to his lips. How do you even... Okay, I can just... Uh, then, in what Edwin thought was adorably brilliant, David would rub the front of his chin as if ice cream was dripping there. Mimic copied every move David made. This encouraged David to teach Mimic more and more things. Mimic is very slow about it, though. Okay, so it's a slow burner. So, Edwin tinkered with Mimic to make sure that David wouldn't get bored. Edwin is impressed with how fast Mimic is learning and hopes that the Mimic 1 program can mature enough to be applied to many tasks. When Edwin looked up from finally finishing the giant chick robot he'd been working on, he found David and Mimic on the floor, colouring. Mimic was actually using crayons. Um, uh-oh. Mimic was using crayons. What? What's the last thing that we see Edwin do in the storyteller? Using crayons, saying, I am sorry. Oh, is that why he's sorry? Because he was abusive and that made the Mimic abusive? Oh no. Oh no, this is getting darker by the second. I, I think wherever this story goes, it's gonna get dark. So be ready, be ready. Um, he's very clumsy with it though, but so is David. Both colour the entire page. A few hours later, Edwin hears a sound, a thwacking sound. A few feet from his work table, Edwin spotted David and Mimic tossing a red rubber ball back and forth. Because David wasn't as uh, all good at throwing or catching a ball, the ball frequently missed his target and bounced across the floor. Undaunted, David scampered after it, retrieved it, and tried again. Mimic's throws, because they were a copy of David's, were just as inconsistent, but David was clearly delighted by the clumsy game of catch. Mimic goes wherever David goes. Uh-oh! He sits at the table when he eats, and it's perched at the edge of the sink when he brushes his teeth. Uh, one evening, as they ate, David pushed his bowl of mac and cheese across the table so it is in front of the Mimic. Mimic immediately took the spoon and scooped su up some of the noodles. Edwin has to rush to make sure Mimic didn't drop them through his open mouth. Uh, it wouldn't have hurt him, it would have just gone throughout the other end of the neck, but Edwin didn't want to clean him. Uh, David laughs at Edwin's comment and Mimic take, take guess Mimic's. Oh, this is, this is kind of cute, actually. Um... I'm just thinking, I was just thinking of the the Afton staff bots, the Afton family staff bots. Imagine if the staff bots are actually mimics, like all of them are mimics. Uh, and that's why they're mimicking the Aftons. Probably not, but uh, he's not making any noise. His mouth is just sort of open. Mimic watches as David puts his leftovers away in the fridge. Because David always carried Tiger, Mimic usually had one of the arms curved in a way that suggested an invisible Tiger. So people are saying, uh, I've heard Entom say at least that Burn Trap has a, a curved arm. Um, so kind of confirmation there that Burn Trap is Mimic. We kind of already knew that anyway, but David decides that Mimic needs his own tiger. Later that day when Edwin was finding up the programming on the pirate... F what? What? That was unexpected. When Edwin was finding out the programming on a pirate fox character, he looked around and spotted David and Mimic by a pile of lace near the levers machine. David looked up and grinned. Then he looked back at the Mimic. Is it ready? He asked Mimic. Mimic nodded. Edwin blinked in amazement. Cradled the curve of Mimic's left arm was an approximation of a tiger. 
Um, David and Mimic made a makeshift tiger plush made of lace and held together with string. That's... That's crazy. He made Foxy? So what I'm what I'm hearing here is is very yeah very timeline accurate actually. So if we're saying this is like the he's he's been bought out by Fast Entertainment or whatever, then Fast Entertainment is just starting, right? Fast Entertainment must just be starting because they have a Bonnie, they have a Freddy, you know, they have Fred Bear and Spring Bonnie. So they've just kind of taken those characters and they've been like Edwin. We're gonna hire you. Please make us some more animal animatronics in the same sort of style that would fit in with the the rest of the band. Uh, and he made Foxy and Chica. Is that so? Am I thinking about this too much? That's interesting. That's interesting details there. That it specifically calls out Chica and Foxy. I wonder if there's gonna be any more cameos in this. That that would be amazing if there were loads of cameos. Um, I mean, there already has been. We've had Mr. Hugs, we've had Chica and Foxy. What the heck? Okay. Um, is it ready? Mimic nodded. Um, Edwin blinked in amazement. Cradle on the curve of Mimic's left arm was an approximation of a tiger. Uh, they made a t makeshift tiger blush. They even managed to make it little tiger ears. Now Edwin is even more conf... Hold on, the Ozone uploaded drowning reaction. <laughs> I got a shout out. Uh, I did know about this, by the way, because uh, I was I was pinged. I, someone uh, underscore actually was like, uh, "Ozone, you just got you your cannon to the live reading," um, and here we are. I am certainly cannon to the live live reading at, at least twice. Uh, hold on, Ozone uploaded drowning reaction. Yeah, I uploaded at the same time this was happening, so that's cool. Um, maybe Ozone is inside. Wow, cool. Anyway, <sighs> hello. <laughs> Uh, now Edwin is even more confident in leaving David in Mimic's care, giving him more time to work. Edwin tries explaining what cavities are up to David, um, and he points out that Mimic never actually brushes his teeth, yet he never gets it. Right. David swings his toothbrush around and gets toothpaste everywhere, including his clean shirt. Let me guess, the Mimic is going to Mimic. They have to go to the laundromat to get clothes clean, which Edwin hates, and he gets after David, which causes David to cry. David hunches over and Mimic does the same. Edwin then proceeds to shake David, which makes it worse, and he immediately apologises. Hello, Ozone. <laughs> so out of contact. You get so, um, you get so, um, off topic so quickly. You, it's just like, oh, distraction. Oh, distraction. Uh, no, you're, you're doing a great job of live reading, I, I will say. Uh, this is very difficult to do. Like, I, making videos and finding quotes and stuff is, like, very difficult by itself. And this, you basically have to write out the entire plot for a load of people, uh, including me. Um, but yeah. Anyway, despite his best attempts to show how sorry Edwin is, David ignores him and locks fingers with Mimic. Edwin spent the next several minutes trying to calm David down. The whole time he promised himself he'd do better by his son. Um, Gang, you realise he immediately knew shaking him was wrong and stopped himself. And he also stabbed him with a knife. Yeah, here we go. This is this is where we see we're gonna get um we're gonna get the trauma, we're gonna get aggression, we're gonna get abuse. This is bad. This is very bad. This bodes really badly on on the <laughs> On, on Edwin. Um, David has changed into a fresh t-shirt and brown corduroy pants uh, and he's playing with his cars. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. Edwin has uh, David put the pyjamas away on a shelf next to a hanging rod of Edwin's clothes and Mimic watches the entire time. David, clad in one of the costumes sent by Fazbear Entertainment, was no longer a little boy. He was a yellow dog frolicking around on all fours. Because the costume was too big for David, the dog's limbs flopped all over the concrete. They were getting filthy, and it got worse. Next to David, Mimic was stuffed inside the top part of a green alligator costume. It too was now dirty. So... Right. So we have Mr. Hugs, which is one of Edwin's first creations. We have Chica, basically. I mean, we have a yellow chicken, a bright yellow chicken. We have a pirate fox. Sounds familiar. That's Foxy. Then we have a yellow dog. 
which we haven't seen before, right? Unless it's Sparky. <laughs> Uh, and then we have uh, a green alligator. Surely it's not Monty. Right? Is it Monty? <laughs> no way is it Monty. That's interesting. Okay. Interesting. Uh, I, I, also, I also thought of Old Man Consequences for some reason, but I don't think that's connected. Now Edwin is upset and ends up yelling at David and Mimic. He gets them out of the costumes and they play somewhere else after David is done crying. About half an hour later, David interrupts Edwin doing a sticky soldering job, causing him to fuck it up. Edwin is mad and David looks down at his feet. Mimic does the same. Edwin looks up at the ceiling and watches the spider for a bit, which calms him down. Weird. Edwin tells David to play with Mimic a little longer while he finishes up. A few days ago, Edwin found some. I read ahead a bit. Oh, okay. A few days ago, Edwin found some construction paper that he gave to David and Mimic. You can use this to draw whatever you want, Edwin had said. Neato, Daddy, David had said. Since then, David and Mimic had been doing the manner of odd little drawings that were surrounded by markings that looked vaguely like hieroglyphics. Connected to the storyteller once again. When Edwin had asked David what they were, David had shrugged. It's made up, Daddy. <laughs> As Edwin's finishing the soldering job, he decides to tinker with Mimic once David is asleep. He's been doing this regularly since his creation, so Mimic can do a better job of entertaining David. Perhaps if Mimic was a bit more mobile, Edwin thought. That night, after tucking David into his cot near Edwin's work table, and watching Mimic copy David's big yawn and little eye rub that always preceded settling in with Tiger for sleep, Edwin picked up Mimic and carried him over to the long work table. There, he worked at updating Mimic's program, so Mimic could use his arms and lower torso more fluidly. This new agility would give Mimic an expanded abil ability to play with David. Mimic could be able to, would be able to scoot along the ground, in approximation of the way David often butt scooted across the floor when he was playing. He, could also, he also would be able to get himself up and down stairs, and he'd be able to throw the ball further and retrieve it as well. Edwin also adjusted Mimic's processes so that Mimic could continue to execute more and more complex tasks. Edwin finishes up and goes back to his Fazbear Entertainment work. He then goes to bed and wakes up two hours later to David wanting to play catch. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I need to charge my laptop, so I'll be right back. Okay. I'll go out and wait for you to come and play with me, Daddy, da uh, David said. He hears David go down the slide, but when he calls for him uh, to eat breakfast, he doesn't come. Um, Edwin sees Mimic sitting on Edwin's work table. He calls for David and sees the factory's main double doors wide open. Uh-oh. As Edwin dashed through the factory's open doors, he shouted for David again. Under the shout, he could hear his mind repeating over and over. Please, no, please, no. The next 10 seconds of Edwin's life played out as any normal 10 seconds would. They unfolded one second at a time. For Edwin, however, the 10 seconds compacted into an expanded infinite experience of horror that at once happened instantaneously and also went on forever. Wow, that is great writing. Edwin rushed out... <laughs> Edwin... Edwin rushed out into the brilliant morning sun. Sorry, I lost myself for a minute. Uh, and breathed in a mouthful of humid air just as David's ball bounced into the nearest lane of traffic. Oblivious of the oncoming, oncoming white van, David, a wide grin on his eager face, his legs churning, dashed out onto the highway. His gaze was locked on the bright red ball. Time compressed even more. Edwin could no longer process what he was seeing as a string of events. His mind shut down. All he had were his senses. The roar of an engine. The smell of exhaust. A blur of white skidding past Edwin's gaze, a screech of rubber on asphalt, the stench of burning rubber, the blur of white vibrating to a stop, a sickening thud, a scream, more screeching rubber, shouts. Wow, that's such a good quote right there. Um, I'll comment on this later. It's a storyteller? What? Edwin, as he streaked toward his son, tried to convince himself that what he just watched hadn't happened. Um, but he knew he was lying to himself. As he flew towards his son, Edwin knew he was running both towards something he'd never reach and away from something he'd never escape. Oh, he tried to pick David up, but someone pulls him back, telling him not to move the body. Edwin lashed out, fighting to free himself. Everything lost focus. Edwin could only see flashes of color, crimson red spreading across the expanse of black, bright blue pressing down from overhead, snatches of white and orange and darker blue and yellow. Edwin opened his mouth, and he heard a high-pitched keen. The sound, he realized, was coming from him. 
The arms that gripped him held on even tighter. Edwin's sense failed him. That sounds, the sounds faded into a distant roar. The colours blurred together. The sun was blotted out by a darkness that Edwin intuitively knew was coming from some place within his soul. Wow. That is written so well. So many simple sentences, right? The arms that gripped him held on tighter. That's so effective. Edwin's sense failed him. The sounds faded into a distant roar. The colours blurred together. Like, what does that even mean? The sun was blotted out by a darkness that Edwin intuitively knew was coming from some place within his soul. That's amazing writing right there. That's crazy. Um, blo blotted out by a darkness that was coming from his soul. Agony. That is. That's agony. Um, yeah. That's crazy. That's that's really cool. Two weeks ago, uh, two weeks go by that Edwin doesn't even remember. Although he couldn't remember any of the discrete details, Edwin had an intellectual understanding that he'd lived through his burying his only son. <sighs> Edwin looks in the mirror and looks like shit. He has a scraggly beard growing now. He looks at the mimic and thinks about deactivating him, but doesn't have the energy to. Wait, so I'm I'm a bit confused. Was this a car crash? <laughs> the roar of an engine, right? This was a car crash. I'm I'm, I'm so bad at comprehension. <laughs> um, so is this a car crash or is this the mimic, right? Nearest lane of traffic. It's it's a car crash, or someone's run him over. So how is the mimic involved in this? Me, I'm I'm so freaking stupid. <laughs> I'm so stupid. Um, next in the corner, spreading after drowning. Yeah, I mean, next has got a lot to top after this. Uh, he looks at the mimic and thinks about deactivating him, but doesn't have the energy to. Edwin looks at his current project and realizes he'd been working on it over the past two weeks. Oh right, 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 right. He looks at the mimic and thinks about deactivating him because his son is dead now. He doesn't need the mimic really. Okay, I think. I think that's that's the interpretation there. I, I don't know if I'm stupid or if that's unclear, but like, okay. Uh, I refuse to accept such blasphemy as calling Bonnie Blue. Oh, Edwin picked up a pair of needle nose pliers. He looked at the tangle of wires and then gazed as the endoskeleton he was supposed to be merging with Phasma Entertainment's latest costume, a blue bunny. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. This is so, this is crazy. So Edwin was behind like a lot of the robots. That's mad. Okay. Add this to MatPat's timeline a lot. Uh, you lot. Um, Mimic has climbed up on the table, has a makeshift tiger. Uh, it makes Edwin remember that Mimic tried carrying around David's tiger before Edwin took it. Now he can remember squeezing tiger, crying so hard that his tears soaked tiger's fur. Oh, this is where he gets abusive. I think this is where he starts like beating up the Mimic because he's taking it out. He's taking it out on the Mimic because his son died. It's um... It's like denial and anger, stages of death, right? You, you're anger, angry that someone has died uh, and you're going through grief. Um, the Kubler-Ross model. Um, don't you have anything better to do than stare at me? Here we grow. Oh wait, I missed a part. Now he can remember squeezing Tiger, crying so hard that his tears soaked Tiger's fur. What a line. Edwin glanced at the Mimic. Do, don't you have something better to do than stare at me? Edwin grumbled. Mimic set aside his tiger and lifted both sets of pincers. Forming one sir into a bowl shape, he used the other pincer to make a sh makeshift spoon. Mimic mimicked, uh, Mimic mimed lifting the spoon to his mouth. Then Mimic used his pincers to approximate the gesture of wiping ice cream from his chin. It was David's code for wanting ice cream. He has a sudden need to destroy something. Edwin grabs something metal and heavy. The weight of it felt good in Edwin's hand, so did lifting it. I mean, this, yeah, this is how people cope with death, honestly. Um, <laughs> that, that gif is amazing. That's so funny. Uh, the weight of it felt good in Edwin's hand, so did lifting it. So, so did bringing it down on the animatronic's head. Um, howling like a wild animal, Edwin battered Mimic over and over with the metal rod. Metal sparks against metal. The reverberation of each blow bounced up Edwin's arm, sending jabs of pain into his shoulder. Wow. 
But Edwin didn't care, he only cared about destroying Mimic, pulverizing the only thing that Edwin could attack in an effort to annihilate his pain. He batters his head, thrashes at his chest, and lashes at his arms. What he doesn't realize is that he is fighting a mirror. Like, well, he's fighting a copycat. Um, that is going to mimic his every move. That is going to become aggressive because of his aggression. Uh, and that's how most arguments start, honestly. <laughs> Somebody gets aggressive. The other person gets aggressive because the other person's aggressive. Then the loop carries on. Um, where was I? Uh, Edwin stops when he sees the Mimic's eye dangling out of his socket and realises how much damage he's done. Mimic's eye wasn't the only thing that was out of place. The metal Edwin had used to form Mimic's forehead and jaw was cramped together, compressing Mimic's face. The broken teeth were shoved back into Mimic's head, caught it up in torn and tangled wires. The remainder of Mimic's wiring had been raggedly wrestled away from... Um, Mimic's metallic spine and the spine itself went bent backwards. Mimic's rib cage was crushed in multiple places and Mimic's arms hung askew. Mimic's pincers were mutilated. He was destroying his creation, but he didn't care. For two weeks, Edwin had been lost in a void of despair, and now his despair had turned to rage. He had to get it out somehow or it would consume him. Because Edwin knew, even as he continued to scream and foam at the mouth, that the real object of his anger was himself, and that infuriated him even more. He wanted to destroy himself, but he couldn't. So he, sublimin he, sublim he sublimated his wrath onto Mimic with an intensity he hadn't known he had in him. He had lost in control of humanity. He was evolving into a primitive version of himself, into something ferocious and savage. He could almost feel his murderous thoughts pouring through his muscles and transfusing through the metal into the Mimic systems. Remember guys, Remnant is a conductor of metal. Let me restate that. Metal is a conductor of Remnant. <laughs> uh, and pr probably Agony as well. Uh, it's probably like a good source um, of, uh, I mean, a good place for Agony to camp out in metal. Eventually, he runs out of the strength and anger. He's, his legs go out and he collapses. He collapses to the ground and stared at the remains of his creation, the remains of his son's friend. At some point during Edwin's assault, Mimic had toppled over and now he lay, arms bent in one last tragic copy of Edwin's little boy. Edwin dropped his hand into his knees. His finger dissolved into regret and the regret brought tears that he thought might just flow forever. Dominic put his hands against the peeling paint of the square bricks building double doors. Dominic from Gumdrop Angel? <laughs> no. Um, okay. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Uh, this is right before it was revealed. Everyone had a... S what? What is going on? Hit by a car. Let's go. It was the driver that took your daughter's life, Edwin. Huh? Oh, this is before it was revealed that Edwin had a son. Okay, I was right since day one. Okay, whatever. Whatever. Stop it. Stop it. Oh my gosh. Dominic, he's pushing open the doors to the factory. Despite small slivers of sun, there's wispy grey clouds covering sky. So he has to use his flashlight to see. Behind him is Harry and Glenn. Glenn is confused by a machine in the factory that Dominic assumes is a loom. Uh, a little guy, maybe five foot four if he stood up straight. Harry had the courage of his stature, meaning not at all. He's only there because of the job, which he told Dominic he was considering quitting anyway. Harry is superstitious and scared of having to do the assignment because the building seems creepy. They're going in now. A gush of wind blows Dominic's long hair. The double doors have closed. Boo! Glenn yelled. Um, just in there... Wait, they're giving vague instructions so they aren't exactly sure where that's, what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, just get in there and clean up the mess. Make repairs. Get it handled. Make repairs. I swear that was a line in Help Wanted. Um, Dominic's supervisor, Ron, had instructed, had instructed when Dominic and his buddies got the assignment. Get what handled, Dominic had said. Ron, a balding man with a beer belly, had waved a vague hand and said, Edwin Murray left that place in quite a state when he disappeared a few months ago. The property reverted to Fazbear Entertainment due to breach of contract. Ooh. Ooh. The only thing they know for sure is that the power is out due to a paperwork mix-up with the power company, so they need flashlights. Makes sense, makes sense. 
Dominic is looking around, noticing the two staircases and all the lace. Then he then turns his attention to the work table and the garment rack. Oh. Dominic's flashlight glow picked out a brown Freddy Fazbear costume, a yellow Chica costume, a Foxy costume, a Bonnie costume, and a couple of bright pink and yellow... pink and yellow green court jester costumes? That's so random. That is so random. Okay. Dominic finds an old cot with a bunch of lace in the middle. Dominic mistakes it for an actual tiger cub. There's a bunch of gears and metal rods on the floor. Okay, I am in a different location again. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, he assumes uh, oh, something is inside one of the mattresses at the bottom of the slide. He assumes it's a rat and moves on. Now they're very confused as to what they're supposed to do. Harry thinks they're supposed to finish Murray's project, but Glenn proposes they split up and explore a bit more to be sure. Oh, they're going to find the Mimic and they're going to reactivate it or something like that. Um, or oh, Fazbear Entertainment is going to get hold of the Mimic. They're going to have the Mimic blueprints. Oh, what do I do with that information? Do they use that? Do they use those endoskeletons? Uh, or do they use the Mimic uh, to create the FNAF AR animatronics or something like that? I don't know. Um, Harry thinks they're supposed to finish Mar Murray's project. But Glenn proposes they split up and explore a bit more to be sure. Wait, no, 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 no. They use the mimics to create the endoskeletons in Security Breach. I'm sure that's going to be the case. Um, Dominic knew Harry was actually three years older than Dominic's 24 years, but he didn't look at it. Uh, his narrow chin covered with a little more peach fuzz. Harry's stature wasn't the only thing that was stunted. This light is a bit bright. I'm sorry. Um, cool. Stunted. Uh, where was that? <laughs> Sorry, this is very messy, but I want to get this done right now, right today. I don't have much time. Um, stunted. Where's stunted? Okay, bro. Um, his brain was advanced. Harry was an electronics uh, and robotics whiz. That was why Fazbear Tim hired him, and that's why he was on this team. Dominic and Glenn have an engineering background, but not to that extent. Glenn also does uh, woodworking as a hobby. Dominic and Glenn had, a count, uh, had something else in common. I'm reading ahead, sorry. They both looked older than their years. This was so for Dominic because of the premature grey and his thick, wavy, dark hair, and also because of his dark features. In addition, he was the kind of face... We don't need to know all this. Shut up. Uh, rat. They encounter the rat. You're a... Um, Dominic decides to investigate the second floor while the other two go on the third. Uh, the first two f doors uh, Dominic tried are locked, but the third door leads to a storeroom filled with boxes. The first box has robotic parts in it. The second box, Dominic finds a robotic vacuum in its original packaging. The other boxes contain more of the same. The next room has more boxes, but Fiona's hats, Dominic read out loud, Fiona's shoes, bakeware, photo albums, first floor books, games, puzzles, souvenirs, Edwin's photography equipment. Dominic doesn't know how much, uh, doesn't know much about doesn't know much about Edwin Murray, but he does know his wife died. Poor guy. Next room is more boxes, but in the room after that, it gets interesting. This office, however, had been redone into a living space. It held an old-fashioned high-back sofa, like the kind of things you'd find in an old mansion, and two wing-back chairs. Um, Dominic's nose twitched as he realised he was smelling rotting food, or something he hoped was rotting, was rotting food. He aimed his flashlight around the tiny kitchen. The counters and the tables were empty, but when Dominic's light whipped across the lower part of the refrigerator, he froze. He peered at a large reddish-brown stain on the dirty, light blue linoleum floor near the fridge's vent. A stiff wire, partly sl uh, silver and partly rust-coloured, lay in the middle of the stain. He goes to investigate, but a rat crawls out and he decides to check later. The next room he enters has a large brat bedroom with a dresser, a couple nightstands, a double bed, and a single bed that's been styled into an impressive white tiger. Dominic smiled, but then his smile faded. Uh, this bed must have belonged to Murray's kid. That was just plain sad. He goes to open a closed door, but stops when he stops a set of narrow shelves full of toys and children's picture books. He started to step back, but then he spots something. Dominic walked around the end of the, uh, the the end of the tiger bed and aimed his light next to a row of plastic cars. The light landed on a satchel, not unlike the ones Dominic, Glenn, and Harry had on the first floor of the building. In fact, the satchel was identical to those. Given that Dominic's satchel and those of his friends were Fazbear Enterprises and issued satchels, Dominic had to conclude that this one was too. Um, Dominic looks inside and finds a tape recorder. It's been stopped in the middle. 
I can't believe they sent us in here the week before Christmas, the man said. He sounded so young, probably about Dominic's age. Joan wants to kill me, and I don't blame her. We were supposed to decorate her tree with our nieces tonight. Instead, I'm trapped in here. And what the hell is up with that? I think we should pry the board off of one of the windows, the voice on the recorder continued. But Terence says if we do that, we'll get fired. We're supposed to clean up a mess in here, not make another one, he says. But seriously, we can get out and go home to our families tonight. I don't get why the door locked behind us to begin with. Why would it lock from the outside? Dominic presses stop. He remembers how the, cl the doors had closed earlier. Okay. I, I was just, I was trying to make a connection with the storyteller because I'm pretty sure the door closes on Mr. Burrows at the end of that, right? suspiciously um, he continues and the voice decides he's going to do document what they've done Terence is the one who suggested we do what we've done the voice on the recorder says because we weren't given real clear instructions on what to do we were pretty much at a loss at first I mean we were in an eerie building filled with old stuff and even older stuff and what are we supposed to do with it sort it catalog it Terence says that he's that because he's a tech guy and I'm an engineer we're probably not expected to go through boxes. He figured we're here to finish the projects we found on the first level, so that's what we've been doing. We started a few hours ago and we worked until just past midnight. It's a good thing we have watches. With the windows all boarded up, you can't tell if it's night or day outside. I'm just glad we found that generator. Without it, we'd have to rely on our flashlights and who knows how long they'd lasted. So, huh? I'm confused now. So like, other people have been here? I, yeah, I don't know. Dominic gets up to find this generator when suddenly an engine powers up and the power returns. He assumes it was Harry and Glenn who did that and investigates more. Yep, something definitely smells dead. Oh, these guys are dead. Uh, and, and the door is locked behind these guys, so these guys are going to be trapped. Okay, I see. Um, something definitely smells dead. He looks at a closed door and opens it to find two rows of hanging clothes and a shelf of folded clothes, but he also finds another door leading to the bedroom he was just in. But wait, the smell is stronger in there. Probably just a dead rat. Dominic continues exploring and only finds a 1920s Underwood typewriter that he wants to take home. As he explores, he just keeps listening to the guy, who explains that they first started with repairs to the building. Dominic enters the last room on the second floor, a bathroom, but he finds nothing but movement that assumes it's a rat. Um... Assess the condition of the endoskeletons we found on and near the work table. Some in, some in were early stages and needed a lot of work, but some just need some adjustments. So we went ahead and did that. And also, after we take a break and share Terence's protein bar, we're going to go ahead and complete one pretty cool endoskeleton. From the waist up, it looks like it should be functional, but it's not moving, the man snorted. And no wonder, the thing doesn't have legs. So we're going to take some legs off of the clearly non-functional animatronics and add them to the more advanced one. Hmm. And that's how the mimic is created. <laughs> Dominic meets back up with Harry and Glenn, and Harry insists he saw something upstairs. Glenn now smells it too. Dominic informs the other about what he heard, uh, had learned, and sure enough, they're trapped too. There's no other doors in the factory that leads outside. Harry gasps. One of the gestures is gone. Gestures? Jesters is gone. Oh, I see. I see, I see, I see. Ha <laughs> ha. This is the mimic. The mimic is alive. And he's taken the suits and he's being aggressive because that's what Edwin was doing to him. Very cool. Very cool story. Um, Glenn now says that he should investigate because of the smell on the second floor. Uh, and I say I have to go. I have a sister p to pick up from book club. What? OK. Um, they've opened the fridge and are disgusted. Harry's thrown up. Dominic wondered if the man who'd been broken down and compressed like a compacted doll before being crammed into the fridge was the man who'd made the tape recording, or was it Terence? Or maybe it was someone else. Whoever it had been, garrowed, uh, garroted so violently that he was nearly decapitated. Then his limbs had been snapped and crimpled so that his entire body could fit inside the fridge. I wonder, where did we see that before? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. That thing about the smell in the makeshift closet, Glenn and Dominic go to it while Harry waits. It only took seconds to reach the door that opened into the room Murray and his son had used as a closet, and it took another second to flip on the light switch by the door. Why hadn't Dominic turned on the light when he looked into the room earlier? Probably because of that, he thought, when he saw the body hanging among the clothing that was stored on the rod running along the back of the, the back wall of the room. Wow. Wow, wow, wow.
Oh. My. God, that's so cool. That's such a cool detail. That's really cool. It's specifically said that the Mimic sees this rod. He's not improvising. He has seen all of these things. He's seen people do things. He's seen David put the pyjamas away on a shelf next to the hanging rod. And so when... Oh my god, this is amazing. When, when the Mimic kills someone, where does he put it? Well, from past experience, he's seen David put this, like, this body thing, that, like, clothing that looks kind of, kind of looks like a human body on this shelf by the hanging rod or on the hanging rod. And so Mimic saw that all that time ago and it's now coming back up because he is programmed to Mimic. Ah, this is amazing. This is so cool. That's that's great. Well done for picking that out. That's great. In the gloom that has filled his room, when he looked at it earlier, the man stowed tidily among a row of men's suits could have passed at a glance for more clothing. In even uh, the unsteady light of the room's fading bulb, though, it was clear that the clothing was on, per uh, was on a corpse, and the corpse was caught up on a hanger. A metal rod had been speared through the corpse's chest, running left to right, and the rod had been wired to a wooden suit hanger. The man hung upright from the hanger, like a, sli like a side of beef dangling on a meat hook. He's been eviscerated. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> uh, Dominic dropped his gaze to the corpse's midsection. He put a hand over his mouth. What he'd first thought were just wrinkles in the man's jeans were actually entrails slopping over his belt. Ugh. Ugh, that's disgusting. Um, <laughs> they run out into the hall. Dominic can't process what he's seeing in time. This is a complete parallel to what's happening right now in the epilogues. Uh, so hopefully we get more in the epilogues about the Mimic. That would be really cool. Uh, and the court gesture. I keep saying gesture. I can't say jester. And the court jester, not a real jester, obviously, but a bright pink and yellow green court jester costume with a wide le leering grin. Something in a grinning jester costume was pulling Harry's brain out the top of Harry's open skull. Harry was dead. He had to be. But he was sitting upright as whatever was in the jester costume scooped the greyish beige pulpy lum out of Harry's head as if the jester wasn't a jester at all but rather was a bear pulling honey from a beehive. Harry's lifeless torso collapsed and his body tumbled forward onto the stairs with a wump. What a death! That is a great death. <laughs> dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Um, I wonder where it learned to put on costumes. I mean, I guess... Oh, right, you're saying in the epilogues where it learned to put on costumes. I mean, I mean, I guess, yeah. Um, but it also could just put on costumes because it sees humans... This is going to sound weird. It sees humans dressed and undressed. Um, they decide to hide in some lace behind the machine. Ten pages left. They hide for a while and somehow Dominic falls asleep. Glenn wakes him up because he hadn't heard the thing come down to the first floor. They decide they need a weapon, but nothing in their toolboxes really works as one. They go to the work table and Glenn explains to Dominic, who thinks he understands what's going on, what's going on. Phasma Entertainment wanted a mess to be cleaned up and Team A failed. Now they're Team B and either they stop whatever killed Team A or poor Harry, he said. Anyway... We either stop whatever's in that costume, or we're going to be sealed up in here, just like those other guys. Dominic finds something under the table. He froze as he gazed at the discarded, bloodied court jester costume that lay under the work table. Dominic tried to warn Glenn, but when Glenn brushed past the costumes hanging on the garment rack, he didn't notice the movement of a fuchsia and white mushroom costume with gaping round dark eyes and an O-shaped cavernous mouth. How many freaking costumes are there? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, Glenn tries to run, but the Mushroom Man, story actually calls it that, catches up instantly. Before Glenn can even take a step, the Mushroom Man's hand caught Glenn by the back of his shirt collar. Uh, Glenn flailed, but his efforts weren't enough. The Mushroom Man's other hand grasped the back of Glenn's brown leather belt, then in a motion so fast Dominic could barely follow it, the Mushroom Man lifted Glenn off the ground and held him, belly down, back up for an instant before taking one long stride and ramming Glenn headfirst into the brick wall behind the garment rack. Wow. 
Whatever wore the Mushroom Man costume had superhuman strength. Glenn's head cracked against the brick and was instantly pulverized like a smashed melon. Oh my gosh. The crushed head still attached to Glenn's spine was driven into his neck and then Glenn's shoulders accordioned into the wall. Glenn with shredded tissue and mangled bone from the rib cage up when the Mushroom Man let go of Glenn's belt and dropped the corpse on the concrete. Wow, this is difficult to read. <laughs> this is gory as hell. Um, Dominic runs to the top level of the factory. He compares it to his grandmother's attic on steroids. Um, Dominic thinks the third level could offer a safe place to hide. Terence and the unnamed man on the tape recorder had been there a month before and clearly no one had come here since then. He only has a candy bar. Bro is not surviving another month. Um, he discovered he might have a chance to survive because he looks through the machinery in the attic and tries to look for a way to fight back. He, see, he has a, a load of machinery parts, he just needs tools. He retrieves the other guy's satchel, but on the way he notices that Harry's body is gone. When Dominic had fled the first floor and ran to the, sec uh, to the third floor, he'd passed Harry's body in the second floor landing. Now, however, Harry's body was gone. Instead, the pink and white mushroom costume lay in a crumpled pile. Oh. Wait, is he stuffed in the costume, or has the mimic like dragged him out or something? Hmm. Now that he had tools, he was confident he could build something to stop the costume-wearing killing machine. All he needed was a little time, but time wasn't something he was going to get. There's a pile of costumes and one of them stands up. The costume, its fur matted and rotting, was a greyish purple lion. <laughs> Jesus. With a bedraggled mane and broken whiskers. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a lion, but I doubt it considering it matches Tiger Rock a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, not really. Uh, Dominic tries running, but he doesn't make it. The thing in the lion costume caught Dominic by the ankle just as he was about to descend the stairs. His chin slams against the floor, but it's only the beginning. Yanked backward roughly, thudding up the stairs, Dominic was spun onto his back and slammed to the floor. Once again, this is nothing like what's about to come next. A fireball of agony tore through his midsection, staring at his solar plexus between his ribs. The torch just uh, seared up through his chest and grabbed him by the throat from the inside. Oh, that's gross! So, oh, grabbed him by the throat from the inside? It felt like a band of molten metal was choking him from within. Oh my gosh! Oh my goodness! This is... wow, this is great. I love this. <laughs> Dominic tries to scream but can't. This is because the thing on the lion suit had reached up through Dominic's solar plexus and grabbed his trachea from the inside. The lion was now yanking his trachea back down through his chest. Dominic's heart, hammering impossibly fast, exploded in his chest. <laughs> wow. He fought for breath but couldn't find it. He reached for a coherent thought but couldn't grab that either. That is an amazing line. Instead, Dominic could do nothing but give in to the darkness that mercifully smothered the fiery torment, ripping him open from the inside out. That's it. Wow. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. That was great. Um... So I have a bunch of lore questions. <laughs> um, so again, I will do a hundred percent. Like, tell me what you want in the comments, but I I will definitely do at least a video kind of summarizing all of the points we need to know about Mimic going into Tiger Rock, uh, because Tiger Rock is going to be big as well uh, for obvious reasons. There is the white the the tiger as as it's called. Um, but yeah, that's that's really cool. So one thing that I'm thinking right now is like. The head of the mimic, um, in in epilogue number one, it states that the head of the mimic, like the mimic, looked burnt, right? That's maybe that's maybe that is how they stop this, because Fazbear Entertainment have sent two groups of people to this location, to Edwin's garage or whatever, or to the factory where the mimic resides. And the Mimic has killed both of the groups. So what are they going to do? They're going to burn up the factory, I assume. Uh, and then Mimic's body is burnt. Um, the the head of the Mimic was already crushed by Edwin. It was mentioned that the, the head was like completely dented and stuff. Uh, and so that is why in the epilogue, in, in the first epilogue, it states that it looked like it was a burnt body, but with a new skull, with a new head. 
So that is interesting. I like this story. This is very good. Um, I just really like seeing Edwin's backstory. Um, and it's it's a really cool concept for a story. It opens up a lot of lore possibilities, honestly. Like, we really need to think specifically about the Mimic right now. I think um, we, need, we, we need to kind of solve the ideas of the Mimic. What it is uh, doing, why it's here, like, how it fits into everything else. But it's a really cool story. I want to, uh, like, yesterday, when I did, um, when I did Drowning, I went to my server and I looked at some of the things that you guys were saying in my server um, to do with the spoilers. So, we're going to go back into here. Uh, oh, look, William is actually in my server now. That's pretty cool. Um, and pff, there's so many, there's so much chat about the Mimic. <laughs> Um, people are talking about the map. Okay, well, like, actually, I can't really do this. <laughs> um, what is this? Just now realizing. Edwin dropped his head into his hands. His anger dissolved into regret, and the regret brought tears that he thought just might flow forever. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it literally outlives him. Well, well, I mean, it does. Technically, it does outlive him. Even as he continued to scream and foam at the mouth. <laughs> what? What? That's so random. Uh, this is proof that the new law has been planned. I, I, yeah, I think so. Oh, wait. Is that actually foam at the mouth? Edwin dropped his hand into his hand, his head into his hands. I'm gonna dissolve into regret. Oh, you can see tears? On glitch trap, I never knew that. I never knew that. Or are those tears, or are they like hands on? Either way, great detail. If that was intentional, great detail. Well done, Duckman. For I mean, well done, Enton for pointing that out. Uh. Okay, cool. That why are they why okay why are you talking about the map in in the mimic spoiler channel? Literally. Oh wait, probably because. Oh wait, no. The Mimic doesn't even talk about the Pizzaplex. <laughs> this is so random. Why are you talking about it here? I will literally make a, a Pizzaplex map talk room for you to talk in. Or make your own server or something. Anyway, that was completely off topic. Uh, let me know in the comments what you thought of this story. I think it's pretty good. Like, it's, it's definitely not one of the top stories. There were some gruesome deaths in this. And there were some great concepts uh, and lore here. I was very surprised myself to see all of the original gang here, as well as Mr. Hugs. We have, we can't forget about Mr. Hugs. But, um... Jester. Jester? Like Sun and Moon? No, I'm joking. Uh, probably not. Yeah, that is, that is, that is it for now. Um, so thank you guys so much for watching. I have a lot to think about. I have some videos to make, um... I guess I'll be seeing you in my next live read, which will be either Nexi or Epilogue 6. I don't know if William wants to do... Like, I, I'm pretty sure it said... Oops. I'm pretty sure it said Nexi was... Um, skipped, right. So if no one else gets Nexi by Saturday, I'll do it. So we're going to have a little bit of a break, I think, of, li of live reading. Uh, but I, I want to do the epilogue. Where Can we do the epilogue? <laughs> I want to know what happens in the epilogue. Okay, anyway. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.